give you that little public service announcement. So there's a lot of ideas about who God is and what he's like. And a lot of the ideas that people get about who God is and what he's like come from their hanging out with us. And they see that, that we're people who are, I don't know, have you ever been around somebody who is just, they're a Christian and they're grumpy? Or they're sad all the time? Or they're always complaining about what they don't have? Or it feels like all the things they're supposed to do for God is just so taxing and so tiring and so much? Is God a killjoy? Does God want you to have a boring life? Is God against you being wealthy? Is God against putting you in a powerful position of influence? Is God against pleasure? Is God anti-sex? <laughs> the answer to each of those questions, as you've already said, is a resounding no. God is not against any of those things. He wants to bless us. I want to be careful here. He wants to bless us with wealth and influence and every good thing. None of those things are bad in and of themselves. Those things are neither moral nor immoral. Most things actually are actually morally neutral until they're not. You could be pursuing something that's admirable. You want to get married so you're pursuing a spouse. You want, to, you want to share the love that you and your spouse have together so you want to have children. You're going to school so that you can get a great education, so that you can great, get a great job, so that you can be in a position of, of influence and, and have resources that you can share. None of those things are bad. You want to give to the poor. You want to even rescue people out of sex trafficking. All things worthwhile of our investment. The problem is, as Kyle Eidelman says in his book, God's at War, that the instant something takes the place of God, the moment it becomes an end rather than something to lay at God's throne, it becomes an idol. Now, when we think of idols, we think of something that's, that's either carved or fashioned out of, out of metal, something that somebody bows down to, but the Bible's perspective of an idol is anything that takes the place of God. When something or someone replaces the Lord God in the position of glory in our lives, then that person or thing has become our God. Turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 17, where we'll be today. We want page 178. If you don't happen to have a Bible with you, feel free to pull it out on your phone, or if you need a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you. Turn to page 178. Judges 17, and as you're finding your way there, let me just give a little, little bit of a recap of where we've been. In Judges, we've seen the unflattering, graphic, and all too familiar results when people like us give our hearts and our minds to worship anything, to worship anyone in place of God. We've seen humiliation and degradation as we watched a half-brother slaughter 69 of his father's 70 sons on the altar of power. And a father sacrificed his only child on the altar of achievement and public acclaim. We watched a man of legendary strength be reduced to infantile weakness because he continued to worship at the idol of his own pleasures see those are idols that we all struggle with our own pleasures public acclaim and achievement power influence 
As we've gone through the book of Judges, I don't know about you, if you've been here in this series with us, I've seen myself in many of these people. God continues to reveal my heart and show me the different altars that I tend to bow down to, the different idols that I tend to worship. Well, today won't be a lot different. Interesting thing that happens from here on to the end of Judges. The book of Judges is, is all about the men and women that God raised up to judge Israel, to lead Israel, to guide Israel before they had a king. From chapter 17 to the end, we're all done with the judges. There's not another judge in sight. And there's a huge and very important reason. Four times from Judges chapter 17 to the end of the book, there's a statement that's made. The statement is, in those days there was no king in the land and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The first time the statement is made, it's full like that, and the last time it's full like that. In the middle, it says it two times. In those days, there's no king in the land. And you're supposed to realize, oh, I'm supposed to complete that thought. And so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So these people, God's people, turned away from him completely. And this is what life is like when you kick God off the throne. It gets rather crazy. So, chapter 17, verse 1, we meet a man named Micah. Verse 1 reads this way, this way, Now a man named Micah was from the hill country of Ephraim. Now, Micah, his name means, Who is like Yahweh? Yahweh is the covenant name for God. There are lots of other names that we know from the Old Testament and New Testament that we can know God by. And each of his names talk about his character. The reason he has so many names is because God is so multifaceted in, in us understanding him. It's difficult for one name to capture all that God is. But Yahweh is the one name that always speaks of his covenant with his people. His name, Yahweh, is only going to be mentioned once in the two chapters we're going to look at. Every other time, it's a more generic name, Elohim. Interesting. So we meet Micah. Who is like Yahweh? The irony is that Micah doesn't have a clue what Yahweh's like. It gets worse because his mother doesn't have a clue what Yahweh's like. And by the time we get to verse 31 of chapter 18, we will discover that there's not a person in the land of Israel who understands who Yahweh is like or what Yahweh is like. So the story begins. Micah's mom is distraught. Someone has stolen 1,100 shekels of silver. We don't know how much actually that means. A shekel is a, a weight of, of metal, it's silver. And so 1,100 of these weights it is multiplied thousands of dollars. But to put an exact number to it is very difficult. She has lost 1,100 of these. Somebody stole it. And she pronounces a curse on that person. She doesn't know who it is. I have a suspicion that she suspects who it might be because of who she says it in front of. And what happens when she says it in front of her son, Micah, whose name means who is like Yahweh, he fesses up. Look at verse 2. Micah said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. And then his mother said, the Lord bless you. Micah's mom blessed the Lord. And in the next verse, we'll see in just a minute, he, he commemor she commemorates her blessing of God by consecrated, it, it will say, the silver that had been restored to her. So let's, let's follow along with this. Micah, his name means who is like Yahweh. So his parents 
seem to really love God enough so that they named their child who's like Yahweh. Micah's got a conscience. So, I mean, everybody sins. Everybody does wrong, right? Every, every, the best Christian you know is, is going to sin from time to time. But the thing that speaks of our character is when we confess. So it says something about Micah's character that he confesses. And it says something about his mom that she blesses him. By the way, that the word Lord there, the only time Yahweh is used in these two chapters. And she will tell us in the next verse that she consecrates all of that 1,100 shekels to God. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 reads like this. When he returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, he said, I, she said, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son. Now catch this. To make an image overlaid with silver, I will give it back to you. Okay, up until that point, everything was great. Boy's name means who is like Yahweh. He confessed and he repented and he gave it back. She consecrated it to God. But how did she consecrate it to God? She was going to give it so that she could make an idol. Look at verse 4. So after he returned the silver to his mother, she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith. How, hang on a second. Somebody help me out. How many shekels were stolen from her? How many shekels were returned to her? How many shekels did she give? Ooh. I consecrated all of it to God. Here's 200. What happened to the 900? All of it's consecrated to God. She didn't have to give any of it to God. See, I kind of wonder if her faith was more of a, just a kind of a public display and not the real deal. Like maybe some of us. We get all cleaned up and we look great Sunday morning. But throughout the week, maybe we're more like her than we would like to admit. I know that I can be. So, she takes this 200 shekels and she gives it to a silversmith to make an idol. Now, something you may not know, historically, there were no silversmiths in Israel at this time. How do I know that? Look at this verse from 1 Samuel. It'll be on your screen. There was not a, black, not a blacksmith could be found in the whole of Israel because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords and spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plowshares, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. So Micah's mom sent 200 shekels to a pagan people. They worshiped other gods. And it was so that she could have an idol made that would be worshipped in place of God. And why had she done it? Because she was glad that her son gave her her money back and she consecrated it to Yahweh. How crazy is that? She doesn't have a clue who Yahweh is or how God wants to work in her life. So, with this freshly minted idol in hand, Micah sets up a shrine in his house where he would bow down to this idol. It says that he made an idol and he made an ephod. The idol was probably something that was carved with wood and overlaid with silver because 200 shekels isn't enough to make a, a, a solid one. But the ephod... The ephod is a special garment that priests wear. And Micah made one of those. So if you have a garment for a priest to wear, what do you need to put in the garment? You need a priest. Well, the priests are all supposed to be 
out of the tribe of Levi. And they're all supposed to lead the people in worship. Well, Micah is thinking, this is great. Oh, I don't have a priest. So he sets up his son as priest. You see, when you call the shots in your own life, you get to say whatever happens. When God is not on the throne of your life and you are on the throne of your life, you get to decide what worship looks like. You get to decide what everything looks like for your life. Never happens, but I lost my place. So Micah used his idol, and he used his son as priest to worship and to praise God. Right? Not at all how God wants us to do. And then Micah has a stroke of luck. A Levite comes his way. And he says, hey, I'm going to get this Levite. I'm going to get him to be my priest. Look at what he says in verse 9. Micah said, now I... Um, do we not have verse 9 back there before that? Can they? No? My bad. Okay, never mind. I'll just tell you. I told you I lost my spot. Um, so Micah goes to this, uh, gets this young man that comes to his door, the, the Levite, and he says, hey, you be my priest and I'll pay you this much money and I'll take care of you. And the, the priest says, whoa, hey, it works for me. And so Micah finally has, listen to this, Micah finally has God where he wanted him. Look at what he says in verse 13, the verse that was just on the screen. And Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. He's got God right where he wants him. God's got a blessing. He's got an idol. Right? He's got a, his own priest. Even from the tribe of Levi. He's got his own worship set up. See, at the beginning of Judges, Israel struggled mightily with idols. I mean, they would, they would live for God, and then they would turn away from God and follow after an idol, and then they'd get into really dire straits. And finally, after a time, they would cry out to God and ask God to deliver them, and God would deliver them by raising up a judge. And as long as the judge was alive, they would live for God, and then... When the judge died, they would fall off again. We saw this cycle happen time and time again in the book of Judges. Now God is not even a speck in the rearview mirror. They are living for themselves. Verse 6 says, In those days Israel had no king. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So what it's saying is they lived as though there were no king. And who is the king that they're talking about here in Judges? There's not been a physical king yet. There won't even be talk of that until later. The king they're talking about here in Judges is God himself, Yahweh. Yahweh was to be their king. And in those days, there was no king in the land God was not on the throne, and so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. How tragic that a Levite from the tribe of Beth, uh, from, from Bethlehem, the tribe of Levi, should follow after Micah. He's supposed to teach them the law. He's supposed to teach them how to worship God appropriately. But he went along with Micah's idolatrous plan. But it gets worse. Verse 1 of chapter 18 reads like this. In those days, Israel had no king. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites 
were seeking a place of their own where they might settle because they had not yet come into an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. Now, if, if that's all you knew, you would think, oh, well, it, they're supposed to be getting all their land and stuff. So this, this makes perfect sense that they would, they would do this. The problem was that Dan didn't have, the tribe of Dan didn't have their land because they did not trust God. They did not believe God. So when it came time for them to put up or shut up, they shut up and went away. Chapter 1 and verse 34 reads like this. It kind of gives us the idea. The Amorites, the people that Dan were supposed to be fighting, confined the Danites to the hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plain. You see, God told them there would not be a giant that could stand against you. Even if they have iron chariots, you can decimate them because I will be with you. But the tribe of Dan did not believe God and they were not able to dislodge the Amorites. And the Amorites became a problem for all of Israel from that time on. In Joshua chapter 19 and verse 47, we have a little bit of the backstory for this. But the Danites had difficulty taking possession of their territory, so they went up and they attacked Leshem, took it, put it to the sword, and occupied it. They settled in Leshem and named it Dan after their forefathers. Now, Judges, back to our, our passages in Judges, add the backstory to Joshua's just the facts, ma'am, reporting of Dan's destruction and occupation of Leshem. You see, in the book of Judges, the, the, the town of Leshem is called Laish. The tribe of Dan sent five men to explore the land, looking for a place to call their own. Verse 7 of chapter 18 reads like this. So the five men left and came to Laish, where they saw that the people were living in safety, like the Sidonians, at peace and secure. Since their land lacked nothing, they were prosperous. Also, they lived a long way from the Sidonians and had no relationship with anyone else. So what do we have here? We've got a peaceful people. They don't have an army. They've never had need for one. They don't have weapons of warfare. They've never had need for one. And they are far isolated from anybody else. If they were to call for help, there would be nobody that would come to them. But like middle school bullies in an elementary school playground, the tribe of Dan went to Laish. This is how it reads in verse 27 of chapter 18. Then they took what Micah had made, his priest, and went on to Laish against a people at peace and secure. They attacked them with a sword and burned down their city. There was no one to rescue them because they lived a long way from Sidon and had no relationship with anyone else. The city was in a valley near Beth Rehob. The Danites rebuilt the city, and they settled there. So they attacked this peaceful people and destroyed them. They wouldn't trust God and fight someone armed for war. They looked for somebody weak. And interestingly enough, this area, the city of Laish, was outside of the area God promised the people of Israel. So they're completely outside of all that God wanted for them. God condemns this sort of attack as, an, he calls it an evil scheme. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, he talks about an attack that will come against Israel in the future. Israel will, will be at peace. Israel will not have any enemies that have made themselves known as enemies publicly. And this peaceful people in the years to come will be attacked. And God describes this as an evil scheme. This is how it reads in Ezekiel 38. This is what the sovereign Lord says. On that day, thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil scheme. You will say, I will invade a land of unwalled villages. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls and without gates and bars. So what Dan did is like that, and God would call that an evil scheme. 
When God is sitting on the throne of your life, you, when God is not sitting on the throne of your life, you get to decide what's right. And what you may think is right will only last as long as you have the might to back it up. The tribe of Dan had God right where they wanted him. As the five spies from Dan were exploring the land, they happened upon Micah's house. They met the priest, they saw the idol, they heard about the arrangement that Micah had with, with the Levite, and then they went on their way. Now, after they got home and they rallied their troops for the battle we just talked about to come against Laish, they brought the entire army with them and decided that they needed Micah's lucky rabbit's foot more than he did. Verse 18 of chapter 18 reads this way. When the five men went into Micah's house and took the idol, the ephod, and the household gods, the priest said to them, what are you doing? They answered him, be quiet. Don't say a word. It's pretty tough when they're coming against people who are not armed and ready for war, right? Come with us and be our father and priest. Isn't it better that you serve a tribe and a clan in Israel as priests rather than just one man's household? The priest was very pleased. He took the ephod the household gods and the idol, and went along with the people. Well, when Micah discovered what had happened, he realized that somebody had taken his lucky rabbit's foot and he was not happy. Verse 23 was his response. As they shouted after them, that's Micah and his, his neighbors that he'd gathered together, the Danites turned and said to Micah, what's the matter with you that you've called out, to your, uh, called out your men to fight? He replied, you took the gods I made in my priest and went away. What else am, do I have? How can you ask what's the matter with you? I mean, think about this. What's he saying? He's saying, you took everything important to me. You took the God that I made. I have nothing left. His whole life revolved around this idol that he'd made with his own hands. When God is not king, might makes right. When God is not on the throne of your life, you decide what God you will follow. But any replacement God, any replacement God, anything you choose to bow your knee to, power, prestige, acclaim, wealth, even good things, family, children, will leave you despairing, broken, and empty. And you need to realize that even Dan got their comeuppance. Verse 30 of chapter 18 reads like this, And the people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves. Jonathan, the son of Gershom, by the way, that's the Levite's name, son of Moses and his sons were priests of the tribe of the Danites, forever no until the day somebody stronger came along because whenever you decide who you will worship your choice of worship will always last only until you're no longer able to back it up was given to the tribe of Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. Here's the thing we have to understand about ourselves. Our hearts are idol factories. Kyle Eidelman in his book, Gods at War, says this. Idolatry isn't just one of many sins. Rather, it's the one great sin that all others come from. So if you start scratching at whatever struggle you're dealing with, eventually you'll find that underneath it is a false god. Until that god is dethroned and the Lord God takes his rightful place, you will not have victory. Idolatry is not just an issue. It is the issue. Who or what sits on the throne of your life? Anything 
anyone in place of God will leave you wanting. Like drinking from a cup with holes in the bottom. Jeremiah has within the, the words of that great prophecy words from God in, in chapter 2 and he describes what it's like when we follow after idols or anything that this world has and look for, for long term benefit this is from the message version has this ever happened before that a nation has traded in its gods for gods that aren't even close to gods but my people have traded my glory for empty God dreams and silly God schemes stand in shock heavens at what you see Throw up your hands in disbelief. This can't be. My people have committed a, com a compound sin. They've walked out on me. The fountain of fresh flowing waters, and then they dug cisterns. Cisterns that leak. Cisterns that are no better than sieves. These words were written around 586 B.C. And 2,600 years later, they still pack a punch. Anything can become an idol. The only thing necessary for something or someone to become our idol is for us to pursue it or them in the place of God. So, instead of looking to God as our source of significance, I like the way Kyle Eidelman does this near the end of his book. He pulls back the curtain on some of our 21st century idols. Some of our 21st century gods. Instead of looking to God as a source of comfort, we turn to food. We turn to mindless entertainment. Instead of looking to God as our source of significance, we turn to our careers. We look to our accomplishments. Instead of looking to God as a source of security, we look to money. We look to investments. Instead of looking to God as our source of joy, we look to our spouse. We look to our children. Instead of looking to God as our source of hope, we look to politicians. We look to legislation. Instead of looking to God as our source of truth, we look to popular opinion. We look to academic consensus. Is food, entertainment, money, family, any of the things that Eidelman just referred us to, are they wrong? Are they bad in and of themselves? No. But they might be if they become idols in our lives. What's your why? What's your why? How can you tell if something has become an idol for you? I think one way is to ask a simple question. Ask yourself, why? Why am I eating that second ding-dong? Am I really hungry for a ding-dong? Or is there something else going on? Why do I need to make $50,000 more? Why does my body need to look like that? Why am I willing to break God's moral code to get ahead in business? To get that guy or girl? Why do I get depressed when my political party loses the majority? When my candidate doesn't win? Why does not making the grade put me into a depression death spiral? Maybe we have something in common with Micah. Maybe there's an idol in our lives. 
So much of our religious practice is driven by our behavior. So we need to ask ourselves, what is my true why behind my behavior? See, we can do all the right things for all the wrong motives. So even when it comes to our worship of God, which all of life should be worshiped, even when it comes to why we do that, what, what is your why? Is there an idol even there? Why am I here this morning? Why did I write that check? Why did or didn't I spend time with God? in his word and prayer last week. Why did I talk to my friend who doesn't know Jesus, about Jesus this week? I would challenge you to push yourself. Ask yourself why at least three times. On that third, fourth, or fifth time, you might discover that there's an idol there. That there's something other than God that you're bowing down to. You care more than you should about what other people think about you. You find more of your sense of security in how much money you will make or how much you have in savings or how your investments are doing. Maybe you spend so much time in the gym or watching what you eat because what really is important is that other people see you looking in a certain way and it's become an idol. I don't know what it could be for you, but this week, as you ask yourself, what's my why? I would encourage you to do that in the quietness of your own heart and mind with God throughout the week. As you see the things that you do, don't, don't right now try to write them all down, but as you go through your week, ask yourself why. Why is this so important to me? Why am I doing this? Why am I not doing this? And any of those things that come up as, as you just want to know God better, you want to praise God better, you want to represent Him well, yay God. But anything else, that might be an area God's trying to put His finger on and say, you know what? You need to give this one to me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. What's your why? Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you for providing everything that we need. I want to thank you for seeing the big picture way beyond anything we ever could. You know what we need. We think we know what we need. But when we don't get what we want and we get upset, remind us that you are God. And we can trust you to meet every need that we have. This week, Father, as we go throughout this week, we just want to say thank you, first of all, for giving us another week of life. Remind us each day to ask you to reveal to us what our why is so that we can remember that because you're our shepherd, you give us everything we need. In Jesus' name, amen.